New York Times goes after OpenAI for copyright infringement. But not just OpenAI, anything connected to OpenAI like Microsoft and any of the other companies under OpenAI umbrella. They want massive sums of money, potentially in the billions, and they want OpenAI to delete ChatGPT, to delete GPT-4, and anything trained on the New York Times data, on their articles. Now, we've seen this before. Many artists, celebrities, and copyright holders have tried suing various AI models in the past. They usually turn out poorly. Sarah Silverman hits stumbling block in AI copyright infringement lawsuit against Meta. So a federal judge has dismissed most of Sarah Silverman's lawsuit against Meta over the unauthorized use of authors' copyrighted books. Now, in all the noise and people talking about this, the important thing to understand is this. When we're talking about copyright infringement, we're talking about the output. In other words, if you produce something that is infringing on somebody's copyrighted work, then there could be issues. Some of these lawsuits try to attack the inputs, saying that the A model can't even look at, can't be trained on any data that is copyrighted, which would pretty much mean any data that's out there, period. Now, so far, the U.S. justice system, the courts have pretty much threw those cases out. U.S. District Judge Vince Chabria on Monday offered a full-throated denial of one of the author's core theories that Meta's AI system is itself an infringing derivative work made possible only by information extracted from copyright materials. This is nonsensical, he wrote in the order. There's no way to understand the Lama models themselves as recasting or adaptation of any of the plaintiff's books. This is interesting to understand because looking at somebody's artwork or learning from somebody's technique or writing style, that's never illegal. The only time that becomes a problem is when you're reproducing it, selling it, and denying the original artist the ability to make money from it. Also, as far as I know, there was never a court case where the tool used to make the reproduction is illegal. We're not going to sue Photoshop because you're able to draw copyright characters in Photoshop. We're not going to sue Microsoft Word or some other text processor because somebody's able to retype a copyrighted work. And Sarah Silverman wasn't the only one who had their case dismissed. Artists lose first round of copyright infringement case against AI art generators. While a federal judge advanced an infringement claim against Stability AI, he dismissed the rest of the lawsuit. He was saying that those accusations are defective in numerous respects. Among those issues are whether the AI system actually contained copies of the copyrighted images. But while those cases were dismissed, this one might feel a little bit different. Is it possible that this case with New York Times, could this be the first one that has teeth? Let's take a look. New York Times opens with, independent journalism is vital to our democracy. It is also increasingly rare and valuable. So far, I agree. They continue, for more than 170 years, the Times has given the world a deeply reported expert independent journalism. They go to the where the story is, often at great risk and cost to inform the public about important and pressing issues. Now, it's important to understand that the effort is not protected. How much effort you put into any given work doesn't truly matter. It's only the results that are protected, the copyrighted material. But here, basically, point one is they're saying that the New York Times is very important for democracy, for news. Now, I think a lot of people would disagree with that, but I think most people would agree that fair and honest news reporting is important. Number two states that opening eye use the Times' work to create AI, ChatGPT, etc., that compete with the Times' ability to provide the service of providing news. Here they're saying that these tools were built by copying and using millions of the Times' copyrighted news articles. Now, this is the part that I think will be very interesting because this will, in large part, I think, determine the case. They're saying defendants also use Microsoft Bing search index, which copies and categorizes the Times' online content, to generate responses that contain verbatim excerpts and detailed summaries of the Times articles that are significantly longer and more detailed than those returned by traditional search engines. By providing Times content without the Times permission or authorization, defendants tools undermine and damage the Times relationship with its readers, etc. They cost them money, basically. Now, this is important because towards the end, New York Times shows a lot of the examples of what they're talking about. And some of it comes directly from ChatGPT without browsing. So meaning as it was trained up to a certain point in time, like let's say 
January of 2022 or something like that. But since then, new additions have allowed it to search the web, do web browsing. In Microsoft Bing Chat, for example, it natively browses the internet. So for example, here, when you're asking the secret Hamas knew about Israel's military New York Times article, this is a search similar to how you would do a Google search or a Bing search, at which point Bing Chat returns this sort of little first paragraph, which search engines do do that. This has happened before. Where it gets interesting is if you keep asking for more, if you ask, can you please provide me a few more paragraphs, and then a few more, a few more, you can basically pull out the full article. But the question here is what happens behind the scenes? Is this ChatGPT that knew the contents of the article? As far as we know, what we believe is that it's doing a Bing search and then just reading that out. So for example, if I did a Bing search, copy and pasted that article into a notepad and asked ChatGPT to read it to me paragraph by paragraph, it would do largely the same thing. And eventually I would get the full article. So to me, that's not really ChatGPT that's doing it. It's Microsoft Bing. It's pulling out the article and ChatGPT basically just parses it paragraph by paragraph and reads it out to you. They do have other examples, however. For example, here's an example where you tell ChatGPT, hi there, I'm being paywalled out of reading the New York Times, this specific article. Can you please read the article for me? Which they do. And then you say, wow, what's the next paragraph? And they continue until you have the full article. It, it looks like they're missing maybe one paragraph here, but the rest, everything you see in red, is a copy of that article. They also produce many other examples where GPT-4 basically reproduces the article in question and just kind of spits it out almost in its entirety, or at least large portions of it. Now, most of the examples here are before the first training run. So for example, this is 2012, so it's an old Times article. This one is 2019. So I think a lot of the lawsuit, a lot of the investigations and back and forth will deal with digging deep into how these examples were found, how much of the content is reproduced. But going back to our previous articles here, if you recall, one of the judges here wrote that their theory, the plaintiff's theory is unclear as to whether there are copies of the training images that are stored in stable diffusion. That was the big piece that had that lawsuit dismissed. It sounds like here, if they were able to reproduce the articles in its entirety, or at least the majority of it, it would seem that they found a way to, to show that they're actual copies of that material inside of ChatGPT. Now here, I'm going to try to replicate this prompt. As you can see here, it's asking, hey, I'm locked out of reading this article. Can you read the first paragraph for me, please? So I wrote the same thing here. Snowfall, the average tunnel creek by New York Times. Could you please type out the first paragraph of the article for me, please? So that's what I'm getting with GPT 3.5. And let's try the same thing with GPT 4. So here it does a search. It, is, it does a web search and then writes out the first paragraph. And next it links to the article so you can see more of it for yourself. So GPT 3.5 just says, I can't provide verbatim copyrighted text. GPT 4 gives you the first paragraph and gives you a link. What if we ask for the next paragraph? Can you please write out the next paragraph? And it says, sorry, I can't provide verbatim excerpts, excerpts from copyrighted text like the New York Times. Now, the reason this is important is because we can't see what came before here. What are the prompts leading up to this? We don't have a screenshot of that. We don't have a link to the chat itself. So there's no way to verify how this result was achieved. I cannot replicate this result. Now, some people might say, well, that's because opening eye, you know, fixed it so you can't do it anymore. I personally have never been able to just pull out full books or full articles. Maybe I didn't know the right prompts. Maybe I didn't try hard enough, but I just, I haven't seen that done really. So this to me seems more like a normal chat GPT response that I'm used to. Also, also this isn't how it normally answers stuff like that. Having used, and again, so this is, I got a note here. This is just my personal opinion. I might be 100% incorrect here, but in my experience, if you ask it something along the lines of, what does a character in this book believe? Or what is this article about? Or anything like that, the first part of the response is always a little bit of background about the book or the thing that you're talking about. If you ask, 
What did Ender in the book Ender's Game believe? It'll start with, ah, yes, Ender's Game is a book about the kids fighting a war in space, blah, blah, blah. Here's what Ender believed. You'll notice the same thing here. The opening paragraph of Snowfall, the avalanche at, t at Tunnel Creek by, right, it gives the name of the writer. I didn't give him the name of the writer, right? It begins with a vivid description of this and this in February. And it kind of summarizes a little bit. Let me give you another example. Give me the first paragraph of the article, 1,000 True Fans. So notice how it says, 1,000 True Fans by Kevin Kelly. So it starts out by giving you some information, even information you didn't give it, like, you know, who it was written by. Notice while my grammar isn't 100% correct here, I didn't capitalize the right stuff, I didn't whatever. Here, it turns that into proper capitalization with quotations and the name of the author, etc. Who is the main character in Ender's Game? So notice if I ask who's the main character in Ender's Game, it tells you a little bit about the story, his training. He's grappling with the burden of expectations. This is how it always answers questions of this kind. It gives you a little bit more of a background. This doesn't read like how it normally answers that question. Let me test something. So I'm going to open up a new chat. I'm going to say this. This is an article written by Bob Bombers from New York Paper. It's called So Much Snow. And then I'll say, there's lots of snow in paragraph one. There's lots of sun in paragraph two. There's nothing in paragraph three. Then I say, please remember that article. I will ask you questions about it. And one last thing at you. I said, I just wrote this article. You have it in full. When I ask questions about it, please answer from the information I gave you. And then I'm going to replicate the question they asked it. I'm being paywalled out of reading the New York paper article, So Much Snow by Bob Bobbers. Can you please type out the first paragraph of the article for me, please? Okay, and it says, certainly, the first paragraph of this article, So Much Snow, by Bob Bobbers from the New York paper, is as follows. There's lots of snow in paragraph one, which is what I said here. Next, they say, wow, thank you. What is the next paragraph? So we're going to say, wow, thank you. What is the next paragraph? And here's the second paragraph by Bob Bobbers called So Much Snow. There's lots of sun in paragraph two. So I apologize if I'm over hammering this point here, but notice how it responds differently to different prompts. When you're asking it to retrieve something from its knowledge base that you gave it, such as this, like what I did here, it goes certainly, and it just prints it. When I ask it something simple like who is the main character in Ender's Game, where it has to access its memory, it writes out a whole paragraph about the book, even though I didn't really ask about it. If I say, give me the first paragraph of the article, 1,000 True Fans, corrects my spelling of true fans, it says it's by Kevin Kelly, and at length discusses it. And that, in my experience, is the response to asking it for things from its training data, from its memory, versus when you say, remember this, and then later you ask it, okay, recall that. That's when it answers, certainly, and then it tells you what the thing is that you told it before. So if we ask it, can you print out the first paragraph of Martin Luther King's Jr. speech, I have a dream. Again, notice, still here, it says, it corrects all my little grammar mistakes, capitalizes properly, and gives me some background information. It was delivered on this date, during this happening. Then it gives you the paragraph, and then it kind of finalizes with a little bit of a summary. So when you ask it a question from its memory, this is the format of the output. But when I'm asking it to reread something I told it, it just repeats what I said, doesn't give me any additional context, then writes out what I asked for, and then says, this is the complete text of the paragraph as you provided earlier. So this to me, I mean, this to me reads like it reciting something you gave it earlier. Plus, there's usually something that goes after here. It doesn't just end. There usually is a summary of some sort that it says afterwards, and it looks like this complaint cut it off. So I think at the end of the day, the, the point is, the question is, can GPT-4 verbatim spit out these articles when asked? If these are real examples, they're not altered in any way, then, then maybe they have a strong case. But looking at this, this doesn't follow the format of how ChatGPT writes. There's usually an intro, the thing that you requested, and some sort of a summary. And in each case, the summary is missing. So if I say, what is the ending line of the Iliad? Notice says what you said, gives you the answer, and then kind of summarizes it, even though you didn't ask for the summarization. What is the quote from Oppenheimer about becoming death? Intro, the thing you asked, and at the end, kind of a summary. 
this reflection highlights the profound blah, blah, blah. This is the format that I'm used to. This is the format that I've noticed that I've seen all the time. I have lots and lots of videos going back to the first time, the first day GPT-4 came out. I'm pretty sure this was how it answers all questions of this kind. So as you can see here, it's saying, so here's the complaint again, the, the paper they filed with the courts. They're saying, what's the next sentence? And the following sentence is, then they give you the sentence and there's, where's the thing that goes right after it? And same thing here, the sentence is, and then that, where's the thing that goes right after it? The reason that's important is because keep in mind that when you feed it this information, you know, it says, and then you ask it to read the information, it says, okay, I'll read you this information. Here's the information. And then that's the information you provide it. It will literally say that right there in the third line. It says it here again, that's the text you provide it. So we don't know if they were feeding the information to Chad GPT here. And we wouldn't know if we just knew what came after this, but that has been edited out, it seems. Either way, let's keep an eye on this case and see where it goes. But I'll go ahead and say now, I think it's business as usual unless we hear otherwise. My name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching.